Good afternoon and welcome to the Deaf Education Forum. Thank you very much for attending this afternoon. I'm Arnie Kerridge. I'm President of Deaf Victoria. This forum this afternoon will be live streamed with the assistance of Vic Deaf and their sponsorship this afternoon. Those of you that are connected to the internet this afternoon and to our live streaming will be able to make comment. We have an SMS number which is 0407 568 869. You'll also be able to ask questions during the forum. Please state your name, the email address, your child's school that they attend and also what grade or year level your child is currently. Those of you that are here in the room today and also those that are attending virtually through the live streaming. So I, we really need to know your, the name of the school, the child's year level and we will be putting information up on the screen today, the PowerPoint information. So you will have access that, to that as well. You will have the same access online as what you have access here at the forum. The forum this afternoon is intended for parents and carers with deaf children. It's an opportunity for parents and, and carers to come together to discuss the pertinent issues to do with access. What is happening out there with um, education. We also have other interested stakeholders such as teachers and schools that have come here today as well. You will be given the opportunity to stand up and ask questions. Can I ask please that it's important that you recognise that parents and carers are given the opportunity uh, to take precedence this afternoon in asking questions. As I said before, I'm President of Deaf Victoria. Our organisation is a not-for-profit organisation to provide advocacy services for hard of hearing and deaf people within Victoria at any age. Our organisation believes in access to education because everything happens from when a child enters the educational system right through and for their entire life. So access is really important for these young children to be able to develop social skills, for their academic learning, skill development, giving them a sense of belonging and self-esteem, connection to the community, also important for their own mental health and the feeling that they can be fully involved and their well-being also in life. We don't want them to have to struggle. So advocacy is incredibly important. We're looking at a child when they first enter the education system right through their life. It's not surprising that many deaf people have, I suppose, mental health issues if you compare it to the wider community. Mental health issues, particularly for young deaf people, is a real issue in our community, especially when you compare it to their hearing peers. And I believe it's because the system is not prepared to meet the needs of young deaf children. And these children are way behind their peers. The families of deaf children are now starting to advocate for the rights of their child to gain access to the things that the wider community take for granted. And this is something that will continue on for the life of that child. It's really important that deaf education is a success for our deaf children so that you can all succeed in your life as other people do. Deaf Victoria is funded to provide advocacy, individual advocacy, as well as systemic advocacy. That means that we have individuals come to us and talk about their needs and we can advocate on their behalf. There may be others that have those same needs and hence it becomes a systemic advocacy. One person can't change the system, but in trying to change the system it can be more effective for many. 
So if all of you come together as a group and we do systemic advocacy, it's more effective for the wider community, the wider deaf community. And hopefully that will, the change will come in our lifetime. So it's about your legal rights, the obligation, and so on. I'm going to pass over now to Julie Judd, who is the Aslia Victoria president, and she'll be addressing you. Thanks, Marnie. Is this working? Can you hear me? Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the tr traditional owners of the land that we're on and pay respect to their elders past and present. In addition, I, I would like to acknowledge and pay our deepest respect to deaf pioneers in Victoria, Australia and throughout the world, the ones that advocate for the rights of deaf people and for the use of sign languages. In particular today, we stand in this room that's named after a great individual by the name of John Lovett. John Lovett was integral to the establishment of secondary educational opportunities for deaf children in Victoria more than 30 years ago. His work alongside many others saw the establishment of the first deaf facility, which was what was then known as Heidelberg High School. The principles of the, the work that they did have been whittled away to see successive governments cutting costs and reducing the quality of educational opportunities for deaf students, especially those that use Auslan. I would also like to acknowledge the work of Mr Stan Batson, a tireless advocate who passed away just a week ago. Since the first ed educational interpreters were employed by the Department of Education, as I said over 30 years ago in Victoria, we've not seen policies relating to standards and qualifications. We haven't seen these things addressed. As most, most interpreters that are working in schools receive very low remuneration and very poor working conditions. And these issues have gone largely ignored. Educational interpreters are not required to hold a qualification by NATI, which is the National uh, Association for Interpreter and Translators. This, in Aslia's view, is inappropriate. All other domains of interpreting that interpreters work in require them to have this qualification. We need to make sure that these things are addressed to make sure that quality interpreting services are services are provided. We need to also ensure that occupational health and, health and safety policies are there to protect the health of interpreters. Aslia Victoria's goals are to work with parents, with Deaf Victoria and the education, education department to ensure that these issues are addressed as an immediate concern. Along with the provision of interpreters, which is often denied, and it seems because of funding constraints in the sector. And often, interpreters being employed is, views, is viewed as an unnecessary expense. It is incredulous that in 2016, the teachers require rigorous training and qualifications, yet interpreters do not. The value of quality educational opportunities for deaf students needs to be a major focus for us all. The ratio of one interpreter to six deaf students places even more limitations on interpreters who can't adequately support them, no matter how much they want to. Aslia Victoria and Deaf Victoria wishes to work with and support parents to ensure that the issues that affect the future opportunities for deaf students are addressed. The VDEI, the Victorian Deaf Education Institute, was established a few years ago, but to date, the working conditions of interpreters do not ascribe to best practice guidelines. Support for interpreters by way of professional development is in inadequate. Interpreters are expected to work several hours alone without a break, through lunch breaks, 
through recess breaks, and if their school is lucky enough to have deaf people working there as mentors or students, oh, uh, sorry, or teachers, um, the interpreters are expected to interpret additional meetings on very meagre wages. They're not part of the interdisciplinary team, even though they're the experts in communication. Is this the value that we place on access for deaf students? All these issues, in my opinion, contributes to inequity in our educational system. I look forward to a future where deaf children receive a quality education in Victoria, based on research and best practice protocols. We have a long way to go. But if we all work together, there are more possibilities that things will change. Thank you. I now would like to introduce to you um, a leading disability advocate from the Disability Discrimination Legal Service. Julie has done a lot of work over the years and I know that she's going to be here to inform you about what your rights are as parents and hopefully we can have some really robust discussion after her presentation. Thank you. I've got two mics here. Is that greedy? Does someone else need one? <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Um, and it's good to see that other organisations are just as enthusiastic about this topic as I am. Um, I'm the manager of the Disability Discrimination Legal Service and I see there I'm also a disability advocate. I know it's sometimes confusing. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I'll just tell you that nothing I say today constitutes legal advice. Now I can say anything I want, so that's good. So what I'm keen uh, to do today is make sure that everyone here uh, gets an understanding of what their child's rights are at school. And the word right is very important. It's not a favour when a child with any disability gets what they need to access their education. So when you are asking for a support for your child, you should be going in there with your held, had, head held high, not in uh, hopeful gratitude that someone may throw you a scrap of support. It is the law that your children receive the supports they need so they can access their education on the same basis as others. So you might want to know today if people can have interpreters at school, if they need a hearing loop, and if some of these things are given to them, who's has, who has the responsibility of paying for those things? Do they have the right for a note taker, live captioning, all of those things at the same time? And this all falls under discrimination and human rights law. And in terms of human rights, uh, in Victoria you've got the Charter of Human Rights, um, which is a law that probably none of you have used and, and many of you may not have had much to do with. But you would have also heard of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, and they are human rights legislation. But today we're going to mostly focus on discrimination legislation. But both of those types of laws uphold the rights of deaf students to access their education. So I want to talk about um, what discrimination is. And even though we've got some questions at the end, some of the things I'm talking about, um, you might uh, want to ask me what on earth I'm saying as we go, because when you're talking about laws, things get a little complicated. So if as I'm talking, um, you can't, uh, you're not really grasping what I'm saying, don't leave it till the end, just put your hand up and interrupt and we can go over it. But there's basically two types of um, discrimination and one is direct and one's indirect and uh, both are normally illegal and I, I want to tell you what they are. Um, under direct discrimination due to changes in legislation uh, in the last few years, um, part of direct discrimination is also the failure 
to provide reasonable adjustments. And look, I'm using the laws of, uh, words of the law here, but really reasonable adjustments are just supports. So I want to tell you what that means. Thanks, Daniel. So direct discrimination is when someone treats you worse than other people just because you have a disability. And um, there's two laws in, uh, that cover people in Victoria with disabilities and one is the Equal Opportunity Act and one is the Disability Discrimination Act. And the Equal Opportunity Act covers all Victorians and the Disability Discrimination Act, which we call the DDA, covers all Australians. And most of those uh, components in those laws are the same, but they've got slight differences. So one law says that it's illegal when someone treats you worse than other people, and another law says that it's illegal when you just get treated poorly because of your disability. So here's just an, an example um, to illustrate direct discrimination. A deaf person applies for a job doing data entry and the boss says they don't believe a deaf person can do the job properly because they can't hear. So clearly that job of data entry doesn't require you to hear and there's really no good reason except that boss's prejudice. They're just treating you badly because you're deaf. A second example is the parents of a deaf child try to enrol her in the local school and the principal says they don't have the money to support her so she should go to another school. And I notice when people contact me a lot of the time that um, some uh, school teachers and principals may not just say no we will not or you cannot but they'll say things in such a way for example that that example there where it means the parent goes oh okay I can't come here so they don't they will rarely say no we can't enroll your child because she's deaf they'll say oh we don't have the same expertise as this other school and this school over here would be better because they're bigger and they've got more resources but really the bottom line is um, that they actually can't say that your child can't come so that is direct discrimination So we were talking before about examples of reasonable adjustments or um, uh, reasonable supports. So here's a few of them, Auslan interpreter. Different ways of doing an assessment. So a deaf person who has been brought up uh, with Auslan as their first language, their English um, may not be as good as other people's English in the school not that it shouldn't be able to be. Um, and so they may want to do their assessment or their exam through Auslan on video rather than having to do a written test. So that's an example of a support or an adjustment. A note taker, live captioning, hearing loop. Um, and sometimes a reasonable adjustment or support will just be extra tutoring with English because um, for many deaf people, English is not their first language and they might need improved literacy to pass the subject of English, for example. Now, indirect discrimination is a bit different. So if, if direct discrimination is treating someone differently because of their disability, a kind of simple way of putting indirect is when they're treating you the same as a person without a disability. In other words, they're telling you to do something because everybody else has to do it and they're requiring a deaf person to fit in, whether they can fit in and on the same basis as everybody else or not. So um, here's some examples. Telling a deaf child that they can come to school but they won't get any support and will have to learn the same way as everybody else. I don't know if any of you remember a court case in the ACT which was Clark versus Catholic education and in that case um, a boy Jacob Clark applied to go to a Catholic school and they agreed to enrol him but said you won't have an Auslan interpreter. 
Another example is putting on videos at school and getting the whole class to watch them, but not putting subtitles on and say, all right, well, here's the video, everybody. There's no subtitles for you over there, but you'll all have a test on this later on. So it's requiring the deaf student to just sit there and access the video in the same way that everybody else does. And another example is um, forcing deaf students to learn an instrument as part of the curriculum. Now, some deaf people might be able to, but others can't. And so saying, well, everybody has to, so you have to. And the legal terminology for it, for what it's worth, is it's imposing a practice or a requirement on something, uh, somebody, that they just can't comply with. So making them do something that they just can't do. It's like telling someone in a wheelchair, look, you'll just have to get your wheelchair up those steps because everyone else does it that way. Well, some people need special assistance to get the same outcome as everybody else. And for deaf people, it's some of the supports that we talked about before. So then um, the question is, can schools say no when you ask for support? Well, they do, but they can't. And look, there are some examples where they can, but we'll talk about them later on. But generally speaking, making sure that your child has the supports they need to access the education is a right, it's not a favour, it's the law. And um, unfortunately, some parents have been hearing no for so long, or I'm sorry, we don't have enough interpreters, or we, something about budget or whatever. These things are immaterial, and um, one should not take any notice of them. Because generally speaking, in terms of government schools and Catholic education schools, buckets of money for many other things, and that includes independent private schools. Um, so generally speaking, it's the law that you receive these things for your child, with a few exceptions. If something will cost too much money, that will not be the case in a government school because they are the state of Victoria. And while it is no doubt true that schools themselves have limited budgets and often uh, don't actually have enough money at the actual school to provide all the supports that are required, the state of Victoria does, the Department of Education does. And for those of you that have been following the corruption inquiries, I don't know if you noticed how much they spent on the dance routine to herald the Ultranet network, which flopped. Um, the Department of Education and Training have uh, millions of dollars to spend on legal battles and all sorts of things. So you don't worry when the Catholic Education Government School or Scotch College tells you something will cost too much money. Or if something is unreasonable. Now, it might be um, because these things are judged on an individual basis, everybody's case is, that if you asked for your child, I want an Auslan interpreter, I want a note taker, I want live captioning, and I want a hearing loop, and I want these five things, that might not be reasonable. Now, someone could give me an example where it might, but generally speaking, it might not be reasonable. And so it, it would then um, be reasonable for a school to say, well, hang on, um, it seems that probably you only need two of these things. Now, usually these discussions don't always only take place between a school and a parent. You might bring audiologists, speech pathologists, deaf linguistics um, uh, experts, um, uh, other people to come in to explain to the school why certain things are needed. Although I would like to think these days um, you don't really need someone to explain why a deaf person whose first language is uh, Auslan, why they need a sign language interpreter. So it could be that sometimes a parent might ask for something that is unreasonable, but the examples that I've given so far would not be on that unreasonable list.
So I just wanted to quickly touch on some of the court cases that have already taken place in Australia where parents uh, have sued uh, state government. Uh, two uh, were Hurst and Devlin, which I was involved in, in the state of Queensland. And um, interestingly, uh, Devlin was the case of a, a boy who, uh, whose first language was Auslan. Well, I'm not sure he was brought up with Auslan, but he did not rely orally uh, at all on communicating. Um, but Hurst was very interesting because um, Tiana Hurst in that case was a young girl who uh, had a bit of hearing and was oral. And this was a very important case because uh, the judge initially found that discrimination had occurred, but it wasn't illegal because Tiana could comply with the requirement to not have an Auslan interpreter. In other words, the judge pretty well much said, well, look, um, it's clear that she needed one. All the experts are saying she needed one and she wanted one. But she could cope orally. She, you know, she had a bit of hearing. She could lip read. She was doing pretty well in her classes. Um, and so even though it was discriminatory, it wasn't illegal. And then we appealed that decision to the full federal court. And um, it was overturned because um, the law uses the word comply. You have to comply with the conditions. So we said Tiana can't comply with the fact that she has to um, access her class without Auslan. And what these judges found, that um, the word comply shouldn't mean that uh, she could just cope. So it wasn't enough, the judges said, that Tiana could just cope. You know, she struggled, she probably got a few headaches from trying to lip read, her mum helped her, and she got through. But coping wasn't enough, because she had the same right as all the other kids to reach her educational potential. So that was a very important case in terms of deaf education. Then there was Clark, which I mentioned before, and um, the school in that case offered note taking and extra support and all these other things, everything except an Auslan interpreter. And that again went to the full federal court and was found in favour of Jacob, who ended up just going somewhere else. And then Beasley versus State of Victoria. Do we have any Beasleys here? Ah, one, good, there we go, oh, hello. Um, <laughs> and that was another important case because it was uh, a case in relation to science-supported English where the school said, oh no, uh, everything's fine because we're doing science-supported English, um, which as we know is not a language. And, uh, and therefore, in that, uh, in that case, the Department of Education were trying to say that this uh, young man uh, didn't have the right to a language uh, or, or to be taught in a language, uh, which of course hearing kids do. So um, obviously because I work for a law firm, I'm talking about legal responses or remedies to these problems because um, I would assume that uh, parents, if the, their child needs an Auslan interpreter, they simply ask for one. And uh, the way the world works, they should be, um, that should be agreed to. But it's not, and, and therefore I'm talking about the next steps to take when you can't get what you want from your school. So um, I suppose what I'm interested in doing is um, encouraging you, some might say inciting you, to um, really think about these issues and take some action. now. Um, I've given you a very brief summary of what the law is and I've given you a, a very brief summary of what your child's rights are. Um, however, as Julie was saying, um, and I think probably Marnie touched on it as well, you would know of course that your child's ability to get an education will affect the rest of their life. Um, it's uh, the, the area of uh, lack of access for children in Australian schools uh, to their education has just been highlighted in a recent Senate report which came out in January um, and 
really the jury is in and it's quite clear that education for kids with disabilities including deaf is abominable. We've also had um, reports, uh, for example a recent uh, KPMG report um, whose name escapes me was talking about people in Australia um, having high rates of uh, living in socio-economic deprivation um, very high rates and it, it, the interesting thing for us is um, that we are a Western country, we are a rich country, this should not be the case in Australia um, but we, Australia are um, really unfortunately in the backwaters in terms of disability and deaf rights and in fact just being in Thailand um, recently I was watching the interpreter in the corner of the TV which they've had for years, so uh, countries like Pakistan and yet here we are. Uh, I think I've noticed um, Mark's face on TV a few times lately because of a fire, but pretty well much that's it. We are behind in the recognition of Auslan where even, even New Zealand is ahead of us and we are certainly behind um, in terms of deaf education. And as um, I think Julie said, VDEI have been set up for years and we still don't have a policy that enshrines the right of deaf children to Auslan. It is quite incredible and it is something that we should be ashamed of or Australia should be ashamed of. With all the rights for deaf people enshrined in law, we still can't even have the right to a sign language interpreter um, in education. And when I use the term interpreter, I do not refer to people who the education department employs that are not qualified. So, uh, um, so I suppose what I'm suggesting is that um, one of the reasons the three organisations have come together today is because decades later we still don't have these rights, we still have an extremely poor education system and there is no sign at all that things are changing. Um, there's been approaches to this minister, there's been approaches to the previous minister um, demanding that we uh, discuss these issues and we have um, the right to Auslan on the agenda and other supports. Um, and, and so even though I'm talking a lot about interpreters, uh, I'm talking about also the sorts of supports that kids with hearing losses need that, that are in addition to or as an alternative to Auslan interpreters. So it seems that government are not going to act on this and it seems that the uh, VDEI is going to do nothing about it, which leaves all of us here um, to take matters into our own hands. So I suppose that I'm encouraging you to recognise the importance of education for deaf children, um, recognise the links between um, lack of literacy and numeracy with mental health, with poverty, with unemployment, and um, encouraging you to pursue what we talk about today and work as a team to see if we can change this through the law. Now, does anyone have any questions about anything that I've said? Yep, Kim. Thank you, Julie. How are you? Great. I was thinking today, finally we've had a forum such as this because you might recall the last one we had was back in 2006 and Dylan was successful in his case, as you'd recall, that was February 2006, the case that you mentioned. And do we have any government representatives here today? Any people representing the state government attending this forum? Surely they should know better. You know, I've heard all this talk before and it's just a lot of crap because as usual we get the same spin from the state government. And looking at the issue around interpreters, considering Philong Park, VCD, I'm sorry I must say, even other schools where they have deaf facilities and in providing interpreter services, the funding is allocated and the teachers often use that funding somewhere else within the school setting and not specifically for interpreting. So this is still the case today. You know, you can look into it yourself and ask them, what are they spending those interpreter funds on? And I've noticed in the last 10 years, this is still going on. It's 2016, and 
you know, I guess we're fortunate in the respect that we have the human rights. You'd be aware of the um, the UN Convention, which uh, w will improve things. But I really do believe we need a class action. And in 2006, myself and Robin advocated and were successful in that case when we took the, took the Department of Education to court. And then other individuals came out and spoke out later. And really, we needed to have a class action to make it stronger. We ne need to educate our deaf children and have access to interpreter services. So please do stand up for your own kids. My kids have grown up now. Tamara has issues. Vanessa's, Vanessa's family needs support. And, you know, I've said to these families, I'm happy to help them out with the experience that I've had. Um, don't be concerned about what the, the school says about the funds. The funds are actually there. They're available. And the teachers are using it elsewhere. And it's not fair for the education of our deaf children. And we can't let this continue for generations to come. Please do something about it. It takes a brave person to take on the state government. Thank you, Kim. My. Uh, one point and one question. Um, the first point that I'd like to make is um, you've talked about advocating for reasonable adjustments, including things like interpreters and um, devices, hearing loops, things like that. But I also want to make a point that we need to, as a community, advocate for the continuation of deaf schools, deaf bilingual schools, bilingual bicultural schools, which we don't we have VCD at the moment and we have Furlong Park, but neither of them are true bilingual bicultural schools. And that is going to be very, very important for the future of our deaf children and the future of Auslan as a language. Without deaf schools, if they start to close, well, they have closed, but if they close entirely, the future of the language of Auslan is in great jeopardy because most deaf children are born to hearing families. My second question is, um, in my encounters when my daughter went to a mainstream school with a deaf facility was um, I was always told no and even when I brought up the DDA they would always say um, they would point to the line where it says reasonable adjustment and costs being associated so anything that you brought up was not reasonable and it was always down to money so then I had a look at what level of funding my daughter was entitled to they would let me know what level but then they wouldn't tell me how much money was going to, how the money was being allocated, how much money is pooled into the deaf facility and how much could I say, oh, I, 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 as her parent, deem this entirely necessary for her education and allocate some of her funding towards that specific issue. And I was told that I'm not entitled to that information. And I've never been able to get to the bottom of that. I don't know, is that something we're entitled to as parents, knowing where the funding money for our children go within this black hole <laughs> of school funding. Thanks. Um, in terms of whether you're entitled to know, the policies and procedures around the program for students with disabilities are all in favour of the school. Um, so you don't really have the right to know anything, you don't really have the, the right to contribute anything, you don't have the right to have your opinions listened to about what the money does. But what I say to everybody is this, is forget about it. Um, it doesn't matter whether your child receives level one funding or level six funding or no funding at all. It is completely irrelevant. And we have to stop worrying about what um, the, the policies and the procedures of the department because they are irrelevant to the law. Now, there's been a very important decision about reasonable adjustment, um, I think it was last year, called Watts, W-A-T-T-S, um, versus, I think it was Australia Post. And it was an employment case, but the term reasonable adjustments was further defined by the federal court. And this um, interpretation was so broad, it said, um, it said an adjustment was reasonable if it was available to be made. Now, um, this is very interesting. So we need to stop thinking about funding. You, these kids have the right to these supports 
regardless of program for students with disabilities, which is under review because of year after year of compliance, but it doesn't even matter. Um, uh, just forget about internal funding, forget about the school's funding. You need to go to the head office and when people make complaints, legal complaints, they sue the state of Victoria, not Camberwell Primary School or whoever. Thanks for those questions and thanks Julie for providing those answers. I've got lots of text messages so I'm going to try and get through a couple of them from externally and then come back to you guys here in the, in the room. Um, first of all, I need to outline why this event is not being live captioned. We were asked to provide live streaming and we provided it. We provided interpreters because we knew that that would be necessary. We did not get any requests for live captioning and I'm very sorry that we did not provide that. Um, unfortunately, there are three organisations involved that don't have a lot of money and it does come down to money, but we would have provided it and found the money if that was necessary. So um, I'm sorry for those who are relying on live captioning um, for the live stream. So moving on. Um, one question is, do you know, Julie, if the NDIS will be addressed in all of this? Um, look, I don't think you can count on the NDIS to address this issue. Um, I think when the NDIS was first raised, it was discussed that it would not have any application to schools. And when you think about it, the NDIA is an insurance company. It's not going to voluntarily um, give funds to people who by all rights should be having their services covered by the Department of Education, why should they? However, um, I have heard uh, some feedback that some kids um, might also be able to access funds from the NDIA in the same way that some kids with multiple disabilities or severe disabilities now, while they're at school, get individual support packages from DHHS, um, but the responsibility is the Department of Education's and so it's best to assume that generally speaking you won't um, get assistance from the NDIS. Um, the, also the caller before just reminded me to say um, in terms of money and unjustifiable hardship, um, the sorts of schools that may not be able to provide the supports you need might be community schools where they are one single entity like a Steiner school um, because literally they do not have the money. Um, and the, the second thing is that um, obviously for your kids, the first step when you want a reasonable adjustment is to ask for it, but I'm assuming that everybody is past that by now. The next question before we go to the floor in the room here tonight, today, is, is having a non nati accredited interpreter in a classroom an act of discrimination, a breach of our rights? That's from a mum of three deaf kids. Look, I think that probably depends. Um, there are people that call themselves interpreters, I'm assisting some people in um, New South Wales at the moment, who have just done a little certificate too. Um, and nevertheless, they are referred to by schools and government as interpreters. Now, clearly, they do not have the vocabulary or the interpreting skills, because they haven't got any interpreting qualifications. They've just got a bit of language um, so really, it, however, if, if someone had done an interpreting course but not bothered to sit the exam, was absolutely fluent in Auslan um, and had the same skills as a level 2-3 interpreter, well then it might be seen as a reasonable adjustment. It's about the person's ability to do the job and provide the access to the education that your child needs. So equal access, think about this. A hearing teacher who is uh, teaching directly to the class might have a vocabulary of, I have no idea, but let's pick a million words. And they are using those million words of vocabulary to teach their class. 
someone who's got a certificate too in Auslan, so they've been to a few neighbourhood house um, classes, they might have an Auslan vocabulary of 200 signs. Now you can clearly see that that's just not going to work at all. So it's not so much the qualification, except that the qualification proves is usually evidence that you have A, learnt about interpreting as opposed to language, and that you have a certain vocabulary that has um, uh, given you the knowledge to uh, pass tests because you've been tested. And that is important because um, I suppose I could call myself a, a, a doctor as well or a behaviour analyst, but unless anyone um, had evidence that I uh, had passed the exams required to do that, you shouldn't take any notice or receive any services from me. So I guess that's my answer of having a bet each way. My example of having someone who's not qualified with all the skills is highly unlikely, but I just wanted to give that example. Okay, before we move on to questions from the floor, I've had a message come through from Gary Kerridge who has said um, that the DDD, the DDA education standards and what con constitutes proper consultation um, and if possible, could we let you all know about the website, which is www.ddaeducationstandards.info. This has the DDA education standards in plain English and Auslan to help understand how they work. So that's another resource for you. Now, do we have any parents here who would like to raise any issues or ask a question? Okay, I've got a question for you, Julie Judd. Just thinking about my negotiations with schools, I know I've, you know, the department aside, I'm wondering if there's enough interpreters because that's often the question that gets posed to me and that's the, one of the most difficult things. So I'd like your response on that. Um, we have, I feel strange not signing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to continue to speak because um, I'm, I've decided to do that today um, to make it easier for everybody. Um, but Natalie, there is a shortage of interpreters and when the, first interp when the first school was set up for secondary back 30 years ago, that sp sped on the training of interpreters at what was then called Richmond TAFE so that we could get more interpreters trained to work in schools because it was a growing profession. What happened was the schools continued to pay the interpreters at very low rates and industry standards um, grew in other domains of interpreting such as community interpreting and they could earn a living by going into those particular domains. Whereas now, if interpreters went to work in schools, they would be living below the poverty line. It's disgusting how much they are earning, which is why schools cannot attract qualified, top-level interpreters who can earn a decent wage for the years and years of study and skill development that they've put in. So I see it as a systemic issue that if interpreters are seen and valued for what they bring to the education system and paid as such, I think you would find a lot more interpreters going into that part of um, interpreting in that specialisation. But right now, it's just seen as you know the lowest type of work that you can do as an interpreter and if you can't get your qualifications through NATI, then that's where you can work because you're allowed to work there without a qualification. I, I know it doesn't answer your question, but just giving you a bit of, I guess, an idea of the way I see it and how I think things could change if it was given the attention that it deserves. Yeah, 
And let's face it, why bother getting a qualification as an interpreter when you can just get a job as an interpreter with the Department of Education? Oh, you wanted to respond, Natalie? Yep. Okay, this is my second part of my question. I should have stayed up here in the first place. Um, this is posed to either you, Julie Phillips, or Julie Judd. In the negotiation process, you can get the, the principal support. It's really the education department that's the real difficulty, and it's taken about two or three years. And we're still in a situation we still don't have anyone. So, and we sent our kids to a private school in the end because we got nowhere with the public system. And yet the public system would have allowed us to have our child in a local school. Well, if you've got interpreters now at a private school, that says to me that they could have been engaged all along. And therefore, whatever excuses you were being given by the state school were just excuses. And look, um, schools can say a lot of things. They can say, we don't have the money, we can't find them. You shouldn't accept those um, answers um, without asking for evidence of it. And if you yourself can find someone who's qualified and is available, well then you know that that's not true. But certainly the funding in relation to the Department of Education is not, it's not the case that they don't have enough money either. It will never be the case that they don't have enough money. Um, so that's a shame that you had to change schools um, just to get the supports. Because inclusive education and public education are everybody's right. Um, I also want to respond to Gary's um, comment because I feel with his mention of consultation that he was probably egging me on to say something about the standards. There's some good news and the bad news about the disability standards for education which are attached to the DDA. Um, the good news is that um, if you uh, are not a lawyer or are not experienced in law and you read them, they sound quite good and it could be that you might use them to lobby your school um, to get certain things. Uh, the bad news is that they are an appallingly drafted piece of legislation that have been tested in the courts and failed. Um, but most members of the public don't know that. Um, the term consultation has been uh, interpreted by a very conservative federal court judge as just a chat it could be a phone conversation. And so where you might have assumed that a consultation about your child was perhaps sitting down, having a meeting, bringing along a treating practitioner perhaps, um, having an in-depth discussion about their needs and actually being taken notice of, that is not the federal court's interpretation. And in fact, there has been case law um, that says that a school does not need to take any notice of you as a parent, your child or any treating practitioner, which is absolutely incredible. Um, but the Department of Education are very clever in the way they pick their judges to run cases. So if they get a judge who's um, uh, pretty left wing, they normally drop it. And by doing this, they've managed to create this bad law. So um, to be honest, I, um, you know, if people want to use the Disability Stands for Education as an advocacy tool, go ahead. There was recently a review, as is required by law, every five years, uh, last year, of the Disability Standards. And in the report that came out, the federal government, uh, I don't know if they forgot or decided to leave it out, but they did not mention one illegal aspect of the standards, which are a law. So organisations like the Disability Discrimination Legal Service put in a submission saying these have failed, they need to be redrafted. You simply can't have law that can be interpreted uh, to such detriment to deaf people and, and other kids with disabilities. There was no mention of the law itself, so that was very disappointing. Is there any other points that would like to be raised by parents? Brett? Brent? Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't know how this question is relevant, but I don't know. My child's half deaf. He's two years old, so when he goes into school, 
I just want to know if he would have the same access as to a fully deaf child. Like he, he's technically hearing, you could say, but what if he needs to support in his education? That's right. Thank you. Um, no matter how slight a disability, um, if that disability is affecting access to education and if the child needs something to assist them to fully access their education, they can receive it. So you don't have to be profoundly deaf um, to uh, require and receive assistance. You can have a hearing loss, um, which might mean an FM loop is needed or any, any other sort of support. So yeah, if your child needs support, they should receive it. It's pretty well much as simple as that with all the exceptions that I've given before about you know, expense and things like that. Just leading on to that point, um, there's an SMS here from a mum in Western Australia who has a six-year-old son who is deaf. She says that what level of deafness qualifies for an interpreter in school? My six-year-old son is moderately deaf and was den denied access. We were told Auslan is a language of last resort and that I should be using Auslan to support hearing and speech at home, not Auslan without speech. This went on to the AHRC, which was resolved to re-examine my son's educational needs and possibly provide Auslan training to his current educational assistant and possibly increase his educational assistant's time from two hours per week. I will try and stay calm. So how do all of you deaf people feel about hearing your language being described as a last resort? Isn't that terrific? The respect you get from departments of education is incredible. Um, look, it's, um, it's a shame that I wasn't with this mother um, at the Australian Human Rights Commission. Um, I would never um, settle for anything such as a review uh, Look, I hate to say this, but departments of education around Australia are terribly aggressive, very difficult to work with, and I would not um, encourage any um, parent to make a complaint on their own unless they are feisty and strong and know their rights. You really should get someone with you. Um, I'm not criticising anyone. I think it's fabulous that this complaint has been made. But whether, as I said before, whether your child is moderate, mild, severe, it does not matter. It does not matter what the school says they have in their bank accounts. You, you need to forget all about that and just concentrate on the law, which gives them their rights. Another um, SMS that's come through, again from Queensland, uh, in regards to interpreter wages not being suitable, how can we change the interpreter wages? How can we make the system see that interpreters should be paid more and with better occupational health and safety policies? I think I answer, <laughs> I don't know the answer other than um, we have to ensure that we stand up for what we believe in and unfortunately as the interpreter organisation ASLIA, we would be seen as trying to um, push our own barrow. So we can't say to the government, well we need to be paid more, but unfortunately interpreters vote with their feet and also with their pocket. They're not going to stay in a job that doesn't pay their mortgage or pay their petrol for the week. They're just not going to do it. And the ones that do do it are the most amazing individuals that I've ever met. Um, unfortunately, I think that it needs to change just as it has for people who work as speech pathologists, as people who work as other uh, supports in schools that all have professional um, standards and qualifications. Yeah, and the stop stopping the hiring of unqualified interpreters I think would be a good start. Okay, do we have any other comments? Um, so this is a pretty simple question, but I was just wondering, is there such a low level that a um, interpreter can be 
or can they hire any level of interpreter? And no matter how low the standards that they're edu um, that they're teaching, um, can the educator still stay in his place or there? Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Um, the education, the education, Oscar with a K. Yeah. Um, thank you, Oscar. The education department can employ whoever they want to do certain things. And when it comes to interpreters, they don't need to have a qualification. They may be able to fingerspell their own name. That might be enough. And they might be called an educational support worker. So they're not called an interpreter even. There's no term in the, the list of jobs in the education department that qualifies them as an interpreter. They're actually called education support workers. But they could be breaking the law doing that. Other comments? Um, who hasn't said something so far? Yes, come up. deaf school um, but she's in grade one and Auslan is her preferred language so slowly the school is you know we're getting a little bit more Auslan in there but it's a bit of a battle so when we ask for things and just you know um, an example you know they have the FM system um, they have school assemblies um, for the more um, the deaf children who are, can hear better and require the use of the FM system, but the PA system is terrible. So we keep bringing it up. Can we check it? Can someone check it? Can that be fixed? Oh, we think it's okay. You know, nothing really happens. What's the next step? Who do you go to when, you know, it's hard because we obviously want to maintain a good relationship with our team leaders and principals, but when they're just sort of brushing us off, like we can't go straight to the state government. Like who do we... And also legal advice, I guess, is expensive as well. Do you know what I mean? As far as advocacy, who's the best person for us to be talking to? Look, I want to uh, acknowledge that it's really difficult um, because every parent wants a good relationship with the school and no one likes conflict. Even me, believe it or not, I know that's difficult to understand, but, you know, who likes it? There's nothing much fun about it. Um, and so parents are in a bind because, of course, they ask nicely a few times and then they're not getting an answer and they know they have to complain and human beings, what they are, when they receive a complaint, they get annoyed. And, and look, some parents, things have got so bad that they've been banned on oh and grounds from the school. It, it's um, outrageous that things have to come to that. Um, but look, in terms um, of things like uh, the your child has the ac the right to access assembly like everybody else does so if the PA is is faulty um, permanently and and she or he can't well then they have to fix it um, and it's the same with everything else that you say the only the, the the examples of when it gets more difficult are when it's only um, marginally different um, to have something than not have it. But it was interesting you said Auslan is her preference. Um, if Auslan is easier for her to understand, well, this is the same as the Tiana Hurst case that I was talking about before. So it's not enough for your child to just be able to cope. Um, it's, it, she needs to have the same access as everybody else does. Now, um, you, you can go to the region. Um, I roll my eyes when I say that because the region just backs the school. And then you can go to the deputy secretaries and the deputy secretaries um, back the region. Um, it's, um, I would tend to uh, go to a lawyer pretty quickly and I'll tell you why. You need to give yourself a number of months before um, uh, moving to a legal step only because months and years go past. Some of the kids that I work with, by the time the, the court case is on, they've left school. They're on the disability support pension when they didn't need to be. So you have to kind of think, what's a reasonable time to keep lobbying and not getting what is needed and my child missing out in their education? I would say months. Um, look, uh, the disability discrimination legal service is a free community legal service. I'm a free advocate, so it doesn't necessarily 
need to cost you money. Um. Just a reminder to uh, the people out there in live stream land um, to please um, SMS the number on your screens with your name and your email address, the name of the school that your child goes to and we will email the PowerPoint and the video link after the recording's finished today. Another SMS that I've re received is um, uh, anonymous and it states that it is noted nowadays that school teachers make choices about what communication mode to use with deaf kids. For example, a deaf facility decides it's only for oral students and signing students need to go elsewhere. There should be a right for any child to be able to go to a school of their choice and schools need to be flexible. I notice that schools in Victoria are making choices for which communication mode and does a parent and their child have a right to request that the school provide Auslan interpreters or Auslan teachers of the deaf? Yes, they do have that right. Um, if your child was deaf and going to the local school where they were the only deaf child there, there was no deaf unit at all, no expertise, um, in terms of deafness in the teaching staff, they would have to bring it in. Um, because your local, attending your local school is your right. Attending a school with deaf expertise is your right. So teachers cannot make a choice um, and have a blanket policy decision about what um, method of access they are going to provide. And in relation to Dylan Beasley and Pearsdale, that was Pearsdale's um, choice to teach in signed supported English, which wasn't even a language. And this is the problem. A school can decide that they will um, teach in Taiwanese if they want to, but that's not going to be accessible for everybody that goes there. It is the school's obligation, each school's obligation, to provide access to education. Do we have anybody here that would like to make another point? Tamara. Just, uh, a couple of points I'd like to make. My name's Tamara. I have two deaf daughters. One is 12 and the other is six. Now, where to start? The first question, sorry, I'm a little nervous. I don't really like the attention standing up the front here. With my first daughter, she was enrolled in um, the local primary school. They did have a number of deaf students there and I thought it would be a good option for her to be there. Started off beautifully. It really depended on who the principal was at the time. That uh, individual, when she started, left and they brought in another person. And it was interesting to see the amount of advocacy I then had to do. And I had to bring in other professionals to support me in my advocacy of my child. I know that you say that um, the finances of the school shouldn't be an issue, but it is because the principal controls the purse strings of the budget of that school. They provide the number of hours that a child will be supported in the school. So in having to advocate for the rights of my child to have access and getting no's continuously, having done a little bit of investigation, they did not say that the funds needed to be for the support of that child. Those funds could go for the gymnasium, they could be refurbishment of the building, and that is an issue. Unfortunately, I was forced, and that's how I see it, to withdraw my child and place my child in a different school. So that was the situation with my first child. The second child was interesting. I had the option of going to one school which was 25 kilometres in one direction and the other school was 25k in the other direction. When we talk about access to pay, to say, the travel allowance, it has to be access to your local school. It doesn't matter whether that, that school has an oral approach or an approach with the use of Auslan. So I was really stuck literally between two schools and the distance between those two schools. 
The one school that provided Auslan, I was not provided with travel funding. The travel funding had ceased, which forced me to then have to go to another school. I spoke to the principal and, and I did my best to try and advocate for my child. They said that they would provide her with a lot of support. However, they wouldn't provide her with Auslan support. I thought things might improve. Uh, I know that there might be some staff here today, um, but you need to remember I'm still a parent. This particular school still had an approach of an oral oral means of communication and education for my child and it isn't what I wanted. I was concerned about the labels that are also being used out there with deaf facilities and deaf schools, that some of those schools are labelled as being an oral only school or an Auslan school. And here we are in 2016 and, and I admit I went to an oral school and here I am having to advocate for the rights of my child to access a school that provides Auslan so that my child feels like they're included and it is an inclusive environment. So my question is how do I change that mindset? I have asked the school that my, my younger child attends and we've debated the issue. They've said, yes, we'll provide support. We'll provide support with Auslan. But that's the extent of it. The mentality, the, the approach within that particular school, there's just so many barriers. How do I deal with that? How do I approach it? Look, I don't mean to sound flippant when I say this, but you sue them. Um, when you said before that um, I said that money isn't an issue but it is, they are telling you that it is but I am telling you that it is not. Um, it is true that principals can do whatever they like with the funding that sometimes you have spent $100 on medical reports to receive. They can pay, use it to pay for the uh, salary of an integration coordinator, they can use it on a building and say that the building helps the students access the school better. So that, that is why I'm saying that the next time someone talks to you about funding, allocations, their rights to spend it, that you shouldn't even get involved because it's the Department of Education whose responsibility this is. And um, again, that's why the State of Victoria is sued. But um, the reason I say that the answer is suing them is this. Um, you have had these stories. These stories go back decades now. And, and therefore, the systemic problem is, uh, has been around for decades. You've got the, I'll let you come back up again, that's all right. You've got the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission report called Held Back from 2012 saying that the um, education for students with disabilities is um, a disgrace, if I may summarise. You've got the Victorian Auditor General's office saying uh, a similar thing. You've now got the Federal Senate saying the same thing. So when you say, what do I do? How do I keep having these conversations? My answer is stop having these conversations. Ask a couple of times and that's it. You go see a lawyer because you can't afford to wait. Sorry, I, I know I'm not pretending it's easy and simple and all of a sudden in two months life will be easy. But clearly for you, life hasn't been easy and you just can't get what you want anyway. I can't comment on transport, but this is the problem of a school labelling itself. We're oral and we're this and we're that, so you'll have to go to another school. You come into problems exactly as you're having. You can't go to your local school because they say they're this and not that. And then you've got transport problems going over here. It, it, it's, every school must make themselves accessible. I think it's important that I'm not the only one. There are many parents out there that feel very isolated. We need to set up some sort of support group. The information that you're, you're giving me today is, is fabulous, but you get so engrossed as a parent and you feel so overwhelmed as a parent having to deal with these situations. So I think today is a wonderful opportunity for parents um, to come together and I really applaud Deaf Victoria. But at the same time, I think parents need to set up some sort of advocacy group. I, I can see this happening in many situations. I can see that it's impacting our mental health. We, there's marital issues out there in the community as well. Because of this issue, it's overwhelming. 
And look, I also just want to acknowledge there's a huge um, mental health problem um, with parents of kids with disabilities who are having to engage in this vigorous um, advocacy with the school. The stress um, that they are under, having to be in conflict about the simple right to education is huge. And um, it's got to stop, which is why we've got to change the system rather than um, you know, have little tiny wins everywhere. I'm having trouble keeping up with all the SMSs that are coming in, so I want to be fair to the people that are here in the room and also to people who are on live stream, but I have to keep in mind that this is for Victorian parents, so um, I apologise if I don't get to everybody out there in live stream land. Um, just a comment from a parent here in Victoria, questions for myself, is there any chance for parents to change the words for the legal rights? And can parents be involved in change or changing the legal laws? Julie? Um, I, look, I have to say I'm not exactly 100% sure what that means, but if it's a question about can parents change the law, um, law reform is when um, enough people get together and approach um, departments of justice and say this law is not working, it must be changed. And that has, that has ha already happened with the DDA. There was a case called Purvis, P-U-R-V-I-S, where a child who had severe behaviours of concern due to brain injury was expelled and, and the uh, High Court made a decision that it was okay because behaviour is not a disability. And that was such an outrageous decision that the law was changed. So we can change the law if we use it and we find it to be wrong. But um, we can also change uh, policy and procedure by forcing change, um, forcing the departments to pay a lot of money um, in uh, compensation to parents. So it's not easy, but we have a lot of strength when we're together. Another question, um, should TODs work with teachers of the deaf, work with deaf students full-time or part-time in primary education? My son Ryan had a part-time teacher of the deaf on his final year at primary school, 45 minutes in the morning, two days a week, from Jane. And also, teachers of the deaf can't sign fluently and Ryan was struggling to understand her on his final year. We need all teachers of the deaf with Auslan qualifications. I mean, my answer is that it depends. For one child, it might be sufficient, 45 minutes. Um, for another, it might not. So it depends on the individual situation and what the, what the problems that the child is having are. Um, and in terms of teachers of the deaf signing, of course, in other countries, you must be fluent in the native sign language before you can be a teacher of the deaf. But again, it just shows how behind Australia is. Um, sorry, this is long. Um, another one from a parent interstate. We are lobbying with high schools by getting live captioning at the moment, but their reaction is Auslan interpreters are good enough for your child's education. Most of the interpreters are not qualified, let alone interpret in full. And that shows that Education Queensland have no idea that English language and Auslan are different. As deaf, deaf children are going to need to rely on live captioning to boost their knowledge of English. And that's a father of three children. And he said that he also wanted to clarify the earlier statement. As older children get more complex English language at high school, then live captioning is probably a better answer. Look, I don't want to pretend I'm a, a linguistic expert as well, um, but there's a lot of research that shows that there is no reason why 
a deaf person who uses a native sign language can't be taught English through their native sign language. And so the fact that you're having to rely on live captioning as a way to teach the kids English is probably very unfortunate and reflects that the school um, are not... Uh, are not doing their job in teaching English. So what you need is a fluent first language, hopefully Auslan in this country, um, and someone who is fluent in that language or uses a qualified interpreter to teach you English as a second language, as happens in other countries in the world, except here. I'm sorry, there could be one or two schools that do it. Someone can tell me if they do. Um, I just want to apologise to the person that is having a hard time accessing this live streaming. Um, they're not able to follow without um, the, the help of captioning. So I can only apologise. Had Again, I must say that if that was requested, we would have done everything to arrange that. Do we have any questions from the floor? My son is six, he's also deaf and attends uh, one of the same schools as other parents in the room today. Um, my struggle is that his hearing loss is moderate to severe, so he's quite oral, um, but at the same time we teach him Auslan and he does use Auslan to some degree, but I find it very difficult to prove that Auslan is needed for him because he is perceived as being oral, but I do want his education to be as good as anybody else's. I do want him to have access to the language so as he one day will make that choice for himself, which path he chooses. So how do I go about proving? I mean, asking and asking, we've all done, um, but what evidence, evidence do I need to provide to the school to, to force their hand? Look, it would be good to get some sort of practitioner report now, this is difficult, of course, because um, kids with hearing loss might go see audiologists and speech pathologists, and some of those people may not have the slightest idea about Auslan. Now, um, I, uh, what you need is, is one of those people who is uh, knowledgeable about Auslan, and maybe even a deaf linguistic expert who can um, write a report for you and recommend that this is what your son and daughter need um, because unfortunately parents are often not taken much notice of and kids aren't taken much notice of but when you have a report from somebody else that says Johnny finds it easier to access the classroom discussion if it is in Auslan um, even though he is oral then that's the first step that you can take that shows that that is a reasonable adjustment to make for him or her. Another SMS. I'm a mother of two children, one of whom is deaf. We are looking into high schools. We have one local high school which has a deaf facility and we have another local mainstream school. We haven't made a final decision about where our children will go, but leaning towards the school without the deaf facility. From what I have heard today, we have every right to send our deaf child to the school we choose and then we should expect that she should get the support she requires. Is this correct understanding? Yes. <laughs> Anybody from the floor? May? I just wanted to address something that I'm quite passionate about and that's access to Auslan, not only for our deaf children, but for us as parents, hearing parents of deaf children. We are our children's language role models and something that I've struggled quite a bit with in doing my own research after my daughter became deaf was that there's a sensitive language acquisition period up until age five. As a hearing parent, I could not find anyone to teach us together Auslan. The only way I could learn Auslan was to go to a community course at night, and that's not necessarily the vocabulary that I'm really needing as a mother of a young child. And I felt that the responsibility of teaching, passing on what I've learned 
as in Ausan to my deaf child was not right. I'm not fluent in any way, shape, or form. And this is still today, there's nowhere for hearing families to learn Auslan. So before we even talk about having, being able to access interpreters and all of these other resources, I think this is a really important subject that needs to be tackled collectively. The fact that we need to be able to provide our children this strong language foundation, and there's no way to do so at the moment. Um, my friend Jenny Kadiki and I have tried desperately to set up a family Auslan class and have had to beg and you know, <laughs> go everywhere looking for funding just to set up something. I don't feel that it should, it should be something that's in place already. Um, it shouldn't be this state of affairs at this point in time. But I just want to make the point that it's so important in the home environment to have a strong language foundation before you can even then get to the point where you can ask for the Auslan interpreter because even though I wanted my child to be bilingual, when I made the requests, like a lot of these other parents have, the answer was, oh, well, she speaks, so she doesn't need an interpreter. Um, it's just dismal. <laughs> Look, this is really relevant, and I'll tell you why. Um, as you've mentioned, um, a lot of deaf kids have hearing parents and hearing parents that don't sign, and it makes it more difficult when the child goes to school and they are oral because they haven't been taught Auslan, but being oral may not have been the best choice for them um, based on their how they use their residual hearing and, and how much hearing they have, etc. And so um, I think it is actually quite relevant to this discussion because when you present at a school one way, like the Beasley family, deaf for generations, you're not going to try and deal with them, you know, and pretend that the kids are oral and they don't need sign language. Um, whereas if you've got a kid who is oral, it's easier for school staff to say, oh, well, look, they're oral anyway, so why do they need, you know, uh, sign language now? So I think that probably we should take a note of that and it's a discussion to talk about on another day, perhaps, perhaps with Vic Deaf, I don't know. Sorry to dob Vic Deaf in. Uh, just a comment and then another question. Um, colleague, interpreter colleague from the ACT, Mandy DeLacy, has said without a pay scale within the education department that recognises NATI accreditation, nothing will change. In the ACT, applicants, interpreter applicants, do not need to prove their skills in order to be employed. By writing it on the application form, it is assumed that you are qualified. And an anonymous question. Um, I understand there's a rep from VDEI here. Can she outline VDEI and their key purposes and what takeaways will VDEI have from today's forum? Is there a VDEI rep here today? No. Okay. We'll move on. Uh, the next comment is, or question, can I please have the name of a good deaf linguistic expert, please? <laughs> possibly Breda Carty, Julie's saying, and um, you could possibly get in contact with um, La Trobe University here in Victoria, who'd be able to um, pass you on to the best person in Victoria. Kim is saying up the back, Robert Adam, but he's in. You are always going to do that. London. He's in London. Any other comments or questions? And we're really keen for deaf for parents to come up, so don't feel shy. This is your opportunity. Hi, I wanted to. Sorry. <laughs> I wanted to talk about um, captioning of videos. Um, there are a lot of great YouTube videos out there that the, the teachers would love to use in, um, in the class, but they're not captioned. And um, my, the school that my daughter 
goes to has a policy where no video is shown that is not captioned, which is fantastic. But um, it is the the law in America that all you know, videos need to be captioned. Um, do we know anything about the progress of, of anything for Australia? Um, I'm not too sure what my question is, but my daughter relies heavily on captioning. And, um, and so she actually watches a lot of um, American clips and, and videos and things on, on the internet because of that, rather than Australian content. Yeah. Um, I think it's more bad news, I'm afraid, um, because we can't even get cinema with open captions here, can we? So, um, again, Australia is behind and I don't have an answer to that. Um, I don't think anything's happening with it that I know of, but if anyone knows of it, they can tell me. Um, just in relation to that, this SMS is about live captioning and captioning in general, just before we go on to the other questions. Um, this comment is that I've heard of interpreters who are told their job is to live caption classes. Is this unethical? And I think that in answer to that, um, it all goes back to your employment agreement. Um, you might be employed to provide so many hours of interpreting and so many hours of live captioning. If you agree to that employment ag agreement, then, well, I don't see the problem there. But um, if it's either you know, one person trying to do the job of two positions, then that's a problem I would see. And I also con am a bit concerned about interpreters also doing live captioning because of occupational health and safety, having to use their arms in that way all day for different purposes. Up the back, somebody had a question. Oh, can you come up the front, please? It was just a comment that VDEI do have a contact where you can get um, videos subtitled, but they need two or three weeks' notice. But apparently, um, the turnaround, yeah, they can have it captioned within two or three weeks. So, good luck. Thank you. Was there another hand that I saw up before? Kim? Just a couple of points uh, in relation to the interpreting issue, particularly around NATI accreditation. Interpreters interpreting within the education system, I guess we're facing a serious situation in terms of ASLIA, what can they do about it, ASLIA, VIC, ECHO interpreting services, the agencies. To do the interpreting agencies or ASLIA Vic have any authority or power to be involved in those types of situations? I guess that's my first question. Second thing, um, thinking about family conversations, I was having a conversation last week within our family reunion out in the country with uh, some relatives and I was asking about um, the school situation for, for one of my nephews and he said that he had interpreters who simply weren't proficient in Auslan at all. So this situation has arisen itself again, it has an impact on his mental health. Um, y you know, there's several generations of deaf families and this is of a major concern. And we're getting the adults who are affected by this outcome as well. So we really need to do something in terms of how it's affecting everybody's mental health. Class action, you know, that's really important. Why can't everybody be involved in a, a class action? Um, this is much more powerful and we can get things moving forward. What do people think about this? Thank you, Kim. Um, just in relation to your point, another SMS has come in saying we can easily access interpreters in mainstream schools here. I wonder where they are. Um, but the issue is quality of interpreting. 
What are our rights to argue the needs of interpreters' levels? Not every level two interpreter can understand the child fluently. Now, for those of you that don't know the interpreter qualification system, level two is what is now called as called paraprofessional, which is the first basic level of accreditation for interpreters. Level three is the first professional level. There's no specialisations in the NATI system at this stage. So we're not even talking about interpreters that have a specialised um, route to training working with children who don't have fully developed language um, themselves as yet. So that's a whole huge issue that I think needs to be addressed. Um, I'm just aware of the time and um, are there any last burning questions or comments that people would like to make before we close the question and discussion section? Hi. Um I just, I guess I want to say thank you for today because um, as a parent of a child who's only, he's six years old but he's only recently been diagnosed, um, this is a whole new world to me so it's great to, um, to have this opportunity. Um, I guess it's kind of a comment, kind of a question, um, with a child who's been late diagnosed and is new to, to all of this, as a family we've been very pushed towards oral education and um, it was only that I have a friend in the community who signed to my child and he responded that um, suddenly my child who had no language skills in one night responded and it was only, I was lucky that I had a friend who showed me that and we've now got him at Aurora, he's learning sign, he's now communicating, it's just been amazing. That's what's right for my child. Um, but what do we do in a world where they're being pushed away from that and we as parents are being pushed away from that? I knew today was going to be emotional but that probably hits the cake, you know, takes the cake. And um, to that friend of yours, I happen to know who she is and she's a good one. Um, but yes, you are left on your own and, and professionals for cultural, historical reasons do push most diagnosed young deaf babies into the oral path. And unfortunately, the research shows that bilingualism, um, regardless of how much hearing the child has, is going to be beneficial. So why would you not? But the whole craze is let's teach hearing babies sign language, which is absolutely ridiculous when deaf children and families cannot have access. So um, I'm glad that you've got that friend and um, we're going to talk about where to from now and that is really up to people in the room today and any ideas coming from live stream. But before we move on to that, I would like to just answer Kim's question which I neglected to answer before as he's walking out the door. <laughs> so I'll answer it later. Um, and Julie would just like to add to that comment. Um, Julie just mentioned research and I think that's really important. Um, get on Google Scholar and actually uh, research some articles about these things because it is very clear, it is very clear um, what the answer is. And um, uh, I won't even tell you how long ago when I used to work for Vic Def for John, John Lovett, and it seems to me that very little has changed. Professionals are still trying to convince parents that they should um, not teach their kids Auslan. And I guess um, it, it's for that reason that decades are passing and nothing is changing that I think it's important that we re recognise that if we want things to change, we're going to have to do it ourselves and with each other. Because so far, if we look at history, we're achieving not much. And you would think after some very uh, high court, federal court, uh, cases, things would change. Departments of Education, I believe, have decided that it is cheaper to wait for families to sue them because they don't often do that than it is to change the system because it will be more expensive to get Auslan interpreters in. 
You wouldn't believe that I very rarely get parents, and the same with Disability Discrimination Legal Service, get parents who want to make a complaint about what's happening to their deaf child at school. And I don't know why. I, I get calls from parents of kids with autism and language disorder. I don't know, which is why we've organised today. I don't know what's happening with the deaf kids and I'm interested to know how we can get that on the move. What a perfect segue to closing up for today. I um, had in my mind, and so did Deaf Victoria, that we would like to see something concrete happen from today. It's obvious that things are not good. Um, people's SMSs, people's comments up the front have just confirmed what we already knew, uh, maybe not aware of how bad it really can be for some. Um, so I would like to propose um, that people, parents who are in the room today, think about uh, perhaps suggesting ways that we move from here. I think, Julie, like I was saying before, we really need to set up an action group or a, perhaps a support group for parents to be able to support one another. I know that you've got the face uh, book page of the Aussie Deaf Kids, which is absolutely fantastic, and they are supportive, but we need to have the more intimate level meetings where we can meet face to face um, throughout each state or capital city and Australia. So we need to be there one-on-one -on -one to support each other and also get people's involvement specifically professionals to guide us because sometimes we can get lost along the way so we need the professionals to be involved in that type of group. So I think we should start with something like that. The other thing I wanted to say is also providing workshops such as this. So getting ideas, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are probably a little bit too shy to ask questions uh, in a public forum such as this but smaller uh, workshops where we can you know, really uh, jot down ideas on butcher's paper about what we want to see happen into the future. And not everybody is confident to be able to stand up in a forum like this. So perhaps getting together in smaller workshop discussions and, yeah, that's certainly going to be important for all of us. Just to add to your comments, Tamara, you're absolutely right. You know, we need to have a support group, but also uh, another sort of active group to be able to lobby the government and I do propose that Deaf Victoria um, establish a, a sort of branch subgroup to be able to take on that role and I'd be more than happy to be involved in that and I'm sure there'd be other people in the room who'd like to partake in that process. Julie Phillips perhaps could give us some advice but um, we do need to have an official organisation or almost like an incorporated organisation to give us that strength to get established. Hi, I'd be um, happy to participate in that group um, and maybe a class action, but I don't know what that entails. <laughs> so maybe some information about that. Um, but I also just wanted to second what May said before. For me, my passion was very much um, not being able to find Auslan in my home when I was desperate to learn it for my child at the rate or at a greater rate than what she was learning it at. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, I think we have two very firm goals. Congratulations. Congratulations to you all. And um, could I put your name down as a contact person? Uh, I don't know what it is, but come and see me afterwards. Um, we have asked, and I will uh, remind people um, on the live stream to please email your name, address, no, not your address, your name, your email address, um, your where your child goes to school and what grade they're in. Um, and I will collate all of the email addresses that people have sent me with their contact details and pass them on to, sorry, what's your name? Kate, pass them on to Kate. And I imagine that Kate, maybe you, along with a few people here tonight, today, um, would be willing to set up a Victorian parents group for parents who have deaf children and 
Aslia Victoria and Deaf Victoria and the Disability Discrimination Legal Service would be right there behind you supporting you in whatever way we can. Congratulations. What a great result. Um, before we close for today, um, I just want to remind you that we have some nibblies on the tables to the side for those that are, that are not on live stream. Um, and I also want to thank people from interstate that have shown such interest um, and been involved in this afternoon's forum. I want to thank all of you and Marnie is going to close for this afternoon. Okay, that's been a fantastic conversation. We've seen various examples of language issues and also non-compliance. Language of last resort was a comment. Interpreters remuneration has been a major issue and they've been classified as communication aids and often not qualified. We've seen conversa conversations around decision making with regards to the student without their involvement in the consultation process and also discussion around local schools and what schools will provide a service limited access to captioning, if at all. And all these issues really do relate to the topic autism. Some of you may be asking, what does autism mean? So autism is a term that has been used. It's kind of a concept, if you like. So it relates to somebody whose hearing is more superior than others. So those who are not hearing are inferior. And it's an attitude based on the dominance of the hearing world and it means that those people are far more superior. The pathology or thinking around the attitude takes precedence. And the idea that we have to actually lobby people, hearing people, to understand our culture and language and norms. But what's imposed on us is that we have to fit in with them. And this really is autism, no matter how you put it. Whether it's a signing deaf person or an oral deaf person, they have to fit in with society's expectations, their norms and behaviours. And there is no adjustment, full stop. We have had the deafness review occur historically, and we're all aware of that. There have been a number of conversations with parents, teachers and professionals around this very topic. We have moved forward in some ways but Deaf Victoria, and including myself as a teacher of the Deaf, I really think the Deaf Review has benefited generally the professionals, not the students or the families themselves. The improvements that have been made have been made at a teaching level in terms of enhancing teachers' skills, their knowledge, their understanding of devices such as hearing aids and cochlear implants, looking at mental health and wellbeing, socialisation skills, but the people on the ground, the children and the families, have been absolutely forgotten. And they're the ones who need the rights and the access to be provided for them. There's too much politics involved with the issues around education for deaf children, and they still exist and have existed for a long time. And I don't think the politics that do exist are, are going to stop or have stopped. And we really see that it's such a divisive issue, and it means that we can't work together to be able to lobby state government and therefore that means that education won't improve and that's my view in terms of autism and how it exists and continues on today. Even now within the school context we have ILPs, individual learning plans or goals, those names change all the time but the discussions around what's appropriate for the deaf child take place and generally who decides? It's the teacher who recommends various aspects and the parents are there and the child is obviously too young to understand what their rights are and they don't know what to say and what they need. So naturally the, the adults in the room override that deaf child's decision. So that's equally similar to the concept of autism. I'd just like to remind people in closing that uh, advocacy is extremely important. It is exhausting as we all know. It's tiring. It's stressful. It takes so much time and energy. And I can see people out there advocating. And those people who do understand and know this. And that's why they, you know, 
people that we're dealing with in state government, they procrastinate, so does Department of Education. Your children are getting older and older, and you can't wait all these years. You need a service there and then. You can't wait for a, an action, um, and you don't have the luxury of time. And this is where advocacy is better as, at a systemic level, not individuals doing it. I mean, the individual work is important, but it's also important to work together to affect the system. Because if you start when your child's at a young age, hopefully you can sort something out rather than wait for several generations to come to actually fight the same issue that they were fighting 10 or 20 years ago. Systemic advocacy can work, and I'll give you two examples. You'd be aware of uh, Disney on Ice. So they have the ice skating performances and so on. They decided recently not to provide interpreter access at a particular venue and an event. Historically, they did provide that service, but this year they decided not to do that throughout the various venues in Australia. And then one parent stood up and said, look, this is not on, and got other parents involved in that process. And as a group, collectively, they were able to get media interviews and have an influence. And as a result, the company was ashamed and decided to provide interpreting services. So that's an example where collective uh, lobbying does actually work. We also had uh, an audiology company, I won't say the name of it, um, decided to make hearing aids look small and say that that was a wonderful thing. And they actually had a promotion on the back of a tram as a picture of a, a prawn saying a hearing aid looks ugly and we should make them disappear into the ears so you're not embarrassed about wearing a hearing aid. And they, and they were adding to the stigma of wearing hearing aids which was quite negative and had a negative effect. A lot of people felt, well, I can't help that I've got a hearing aid and it's visible, and I've got cochlear implants that's visible and people can see that. So a group of people got involved in lobbying, saying this is not on, this is shameful, and that company backed off and removed all those um, billboards that were up around Melbourne. That happened, but these were co you know, sort of small, quick wins which were possible, but as we know, Department of Education, that type of change takes years. So parents with children, you know, you do actually have a lot of power, more than you actually believe. If you get together collectively and lobby the government, it's bad PR for the government and the department to have this kind of action. But you need to sustain it, you need to be powerful, and have a simple message and aim for a simple outcome that's clear that everybody understands. What access do you want? What do you want to see be provided for your children? Get together, discuss it, regardless of you know people using hearing aids or cochlear implants, whether they're oral or they sign, or if they've got a unilateral or bilateral hearing loss, I don't care. The important thing is, what does a child need? Get together and support each other. Don't make it become political and segregated. Sort out one issue at a time and work collectively. If you can do that within that group that you're going to establish, you'll have so many outcomes and it'll be probably be hard to think about, okay, what do you want to start off with? You might want to start off with thinking, okay, two or three priority goals could be established. First of all, establishing various working groups and then look at the appropriate organisation to lead that. So for interpreting, it'd be ASLE Victoria. For advocacy, you might get Deaf Victoria involved. For legal reform, you might approach DDLS and look at the various groups and what you can focus on. You don't want to have too many goals to achieve because you'll just drown in it and the Department of Education will laugh at you. You need to be clever in how you do that. Push the emotional aspect aside and just think logically every step of the way, thinking about what you want and how you can actually achieve it and how, how you're going to get there. This is a, an extremely important first step. It's not about teachers, it's not about the deaf community. It's about your child and what you need to do as parents to give them the most appropriate access, the ability to grow up to be a fully fledged, healthy young person within society who can interact with everybody and be the most outstanding individual or human being they can be. And we'd really like to see that occur too. In this room today we have 34 people in the audience here, so thank you so much for coming along. And on the live streaming we have, just looking at the stats on my page, we've got 40. So all up we've got 74 people who are participating in this forum. 
All the information has been recorded and we'll have a conversation with Deaf Victoria and other organisations to see if we can provide captioning uh, through the post-production stages and make it available for those who'd like to view it with the live, well, the captions that have been established later on. So we'll get back to you on that. It's also important today to have the opportunity to network with other parents and have these open discussions. If some people actually hadn't stood up and said, look, this is, we need to get the conversation going, we wouldn't be here today. And I'd actually like to thank a few people who've enabled this session to happen. Number one, Daniel Haightley. I'd like to thank you, Daniel. Daniel's worked tire tirelessly on getting this seminar or forum established. He's been involved in educational interpreting and has personal contacts and is certainly quite passionate about looking at improvements within the deaf education sector. He's not a parent himself, he doesn't have deaf children, but he can certainly identify major issues that need to be looked at. So thank you so much, Daniel, for all your work in organising this event. Thank you. Julie Judd, just in the front row. So President of Asley Victoria. Again, Julie, um, she's not only f focused on interpreting, but the broader picture, and that's important. And Julie has recognised that educational interpreting is important, but also the access that's provided to the deaf students as well. So thank you so much for raising an important issue again, Julie. <laughs> Tamara Trinda, Skako. I hate finger spelling your name. It's such a, not a tongue twister, but a finger twister. So. As a parent, we know that she's lobbied and advocated for years and years and she's absolutely exhausted, but she's still going and she's very persistent. So thank you so much for your involvement in promoting this event, letting parents know about it. And I know that you'll be involved in one of those groups, definitely, and she's nodded. So thank you. Thank you again for your involvement, Tamara. Julie Phillips. Thank you so much, Julie. Yes, you, from DDLS. Your involvement's been fantastic, explaining the law and, you know, if you see Julie, she'll listen to you, she'll tell you your rights. It's always a positive experience and she reminds people what they can do and what their capacity is. People often feel overwhelmed with the, the conflict at hand and Julie always says, you can do it. So it, it's absolutely fantastic to have a, a person who understands these deaf issues, has the background, can sign, is fluent in Auslan. And thank you so much for always being there for, for all of us and continuing to be there for all of us as well. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the interpreters here today, Mark Quinn and Karen Clare. Thank you both for interpreting today's session. And a big thank you to Vic Dev for providing this venue today and the technology for the live streaming. And Vic Dev, as you probably would know, don't work with deaf children, but again, they see the importance of the bigger picture because those deaf children will become adults and be serviced by Vic Dev later on. So everything does have a knock-on effect regardless as to whether it's now or later. So thank you, Vic Def, for providing the venue and also the technical people working on the equipment. Thank you so much to Michael Parrymore and oh, I can never spell your name, Niaz, let alone pronounce it. Niaz, thank you so much for doing that and all your work. And I'd like to thank one person from the Deaf Victoria Board, Sherry Beaver, and she's been busy tweeting the Twitter universe about what's been going on here to ensure that everybody knows what's happening. So Deaf Victoria is uh, one state or organisational branch and we are quite small. And um, if we have the other states that who can support their local communities, that would be fantastic. New South Wales, WA and Queensland, they all report to Deaf Australia, the peak deaf body nationally. So if we can work together, we're going to be stronger as a collective group. If we're divided, we're much weaker. So it's an opportunity really for us to take a stand and have much more of a, a huger impact nationally. Good luck and I'd like to pass back over to Julie Judd and thank you for having us here today. Bye-bye. Hello. Just one more thing before we close for this afternoon and I know we've gone over 10 minutes but we started 10 minutes late, so I feel that's okay. Um, 
I can't say how pleased I am that Vic Def, at the last minute, were very gracious in offering us the live streaming. It's not a cheap thing to do. And also, Niaz and Michael have given up their Sunday afternoon to work. So I, like Marnie, would like to thank them. And because of their kindness in letting us use the room today, I'd like to just ask Brent Phillips to, Phillips to just say a few words before we finish. Thank you, Julie. Vic Diff uh, is certainly pleased to organise uh, or be involved in this discussion. It's been critical. I'm, I was looking at the comments on live streaming and a lot of people have been saying they wish this happened, um, you know, years ago or months ago, but it certainly had a huge impact. And I'd just like to make a comment. First of all, as a father of deaf, two, deaf, uh, sorry, two children, one um, who's three and the other one is one, they're both uh, hearing. Um, we also deal with the parents who have deaf children and often people ask me, are your kids hearing or deaf? And I say they're hearing and this. they often say to me, you're so lucky, you haven't had to go through all the challenges I have had. And I think, wow, this is 2016 and people should be able to live life to the fullest without these barriers, have the best to education. Parents should be able to parent without dealing with all these issues. So it shouldn't be about um, someone who's lucky or unlucky and I personally feel honoured to be part of today's session. And Marnie's right, um, you know, Vic Def hasn't worked with deaf children previously, but if you look at our new strategic plan at the back of the room from 2015 to 2020, which we launched last year, um, it's green and blue, you'll see that, I'll just let people have a look, there's a few commitments that are part of the strategic plan. So one of them is to advocate, and previously we have not provided that service. So we're, we're committing to advocate um, in partnerships with organisations such as Victoria and so on, but also there's a commitment to family and children, which we didn't previously focus on. So working in collaboration with Deaf Children Australia, we see them as a key partner in achieving this outcome. The commitment that we have there is to partner with the community to also increase the impact that we have on deaf people. And this is one example of our commitment, providing forums such as this into the future. And I'm happy to say that Vic Deaf will be providing ongoing support, whether you, you want meeting rooms or interpreter access for the various groups that you're going to establish. We're more than happy to work with you to support uh, you in that and also um, upload the, the captioning. So I'm happy to work with you, Julie, on that. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon. Thank you.